Okay, so uh, good evening to all of you. Thank you. Thank you for coming back, you know, uh, some of you, and for new friends this evening. We have, you know, continuing from uh, our chat last week with Russell. Uh, this evening we're going to be talking to Desmond, um, a writer whom you are going to hear a lot about. Uh, a writer, a playwright, a painter, an educator, multi hyphenate. Please welcome Desmond Sim. Desmond! Hello. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi. Come on in. Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> So he's going to be uh, mic'd up and then uh, you know, while he's mic'ing up, uh, we'll just, uh, uh, for those of you who are here for the first time, just uh, a little bit to tell you what this is all about. The Living Room, a series of conversations that we have with writers uh, and we want to find out you know, the stories behind their writings because I think a lot of the times what you, you read about in the reviews in the newspapers is you know, this play written by so-and-so, I like it. <laughs> I didn't like it, you know? And then that's about it, right? And you don't hear very much uh, beyond that. Uh, and if at all, you know, sometimes uh, when, when you do get that interview with the playwright, you hear a little bit more, you know, but then a lot of it uh, might also be construed as marketing spiel, right? So, uh, so, you know, this Living Room series is really to go beyond all of that and to find out, you know, what, what were the stories behind the stories. So, uh, we're going to begin, all right? So, uh, Desmond, welcome to the Thank Living you. Room. This is your class, okay. my class. <laughs> okay, so uh, I want to ask you, uh, for you as a writer now, you know, so much work uh, under your belt, but how did it all begin when you were a child? Oh, God, okay. <laughs> um, okay, I, I wrote poetry, actually, that's all, that was my entry point. Um, rhymes at six years old, and my mom kind of like put me up to at that time RTS, which was the predecessor of Media Corp, Radio Television Singapore. <laughs> I read my poetry online, uh, you know, on the radio, and I thought, wow, people listen, okay? So, um, and I continued writing. I was a voracious reader. I read six books a week, um, yeah. Um, so that was like for the first 10 years of my life. I had no friends, um, all books. <laughs> um, and then, um, yeah, so I started writing for school magazines, started, started writing, writing for school plays. Uh, NUS, I wrote also. Um, we used to escape lessons. Uh, Ivan Heng and Sweelin and I used to perform in front of a, a piano. Uh, we would have an audience in Gopo Singh's bar and we would do little skits for everyone, you know. So on the way, we'll be rehearsing our lines in the taxi uh, because we had to go for lectures in the morning, right? And then, okay, and so at night. And that's how, that's how it began. So as a, as a child, it was your mother who encouraged all yeah, this? Yeah, English teacher, yeah. Okay, <laughs> so that's a secret. Yeah, I have English teacher mothers, yeah. Okay, so, uh, you know, she encouraged you to do all this and then, you know, uh, RTS as well, and then... Uh... Actually, a little bit more than that. My father was a storyteller. Um, he used to put three of us on a grass mat and he would tell us stories about World War II, about what happened to him, his family. Um, he would just sit us there and... We took it as very natural, you know. After dinner, Dad would, Dad would want to tell his stories, okay, they just sat there. And those were great moments. Um, you begin to hear about other lives other than your own. Um, okay, and then I lived in a Peranakan home. Because my father moved into my mother's home and it was an extended family. And you know, Peranakan family is a lot of drama, right? You know? <laughs> Everything became a drama, right? So like my granny would burst into the breakfast and say, oh my God, there's a huge lump of poop in the can. You know, because at that time it was the night soil, right? And that became a huge drama over breakfast, right? Whose was it and if no one wants to own up, you know? It's really silly, but you know, you grew up in that environment and you learn to tell stories, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and then, uh, uh, so, so from this kind of like very rich uh, childhood, uh, storytelling, uh, writing as well, right? Then uh, you grew up, and then there was, uh, what, you had a scholarship? Uh, actually, well, I went to university. Mm. Um, and I guess... This I, is uh, NUS? Uh, I went to NUS. Okay. I, I took literature and I took uh, Lang and philosophy. Mm. Great, all reading subjects which I loved. I, I loved reading. Mm. Um, and then um, 
And then somewhere in the final year, I, I, I looked at an ad and it said like um, Japan Airlines scho summer scholarship to Tokyo, um, seven weeks, right? And all I saw was free holiday. Um, so, so I, oh, right, essay, free holiday. Okay, so I did that and I got to go. Um, mind blowing because I got to do Japanese theatre, I got to do Japanese art history, and I got to go to so many museums and everything. So that's quite amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so did that, uh, you know, create some kind of impression on you as a writer? I came back not thinking in the same square box anymore. My, my sense of aesthetics had changed. Mm. Um, I began to understand silence because there were a lot of Shinto shrines that I wondered why they were also silent. I found out why. I understand negative space. I understood a lot of other concepts beyond what I grew up with. Mm. So I never thought the same way again, which was weird because I never consciously wanted to be that different. Um, except that after a while, when you come back and people start asking you, are you local? And you go, oh. Yeah, I, I'm thinking differently. I, I'm not expressing the same way as many others here. And I don't even do that to differentiate myself. Mm -hmm. it, it just was organic, yeah. What, why were they asking you, are you local? Uh, I don't know. I asked a, a shopkeeper once who asked me that question. Why do you ask me? Mm -hmm. He said, because you are very advanced. Huh? So I was like, <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know whether it's my reasoning or my logic. Of course, I talked to him, right? Mm -hmm. I'm interested in characters, so I use them in my place. So I talked to him and then as we talked, he just sensed that I was different as well. Mm. And to him that was foreign, so maybe mm. that was foreign, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. And, and by this time, were you already writing plays? Yeah, I guess so. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, you actually did something for the Shell uh, NUS Okay, um, I was on scholarship in the NUS to do my master's, right? And they were paying me every month for three years to write a huge thesis. Um, I had a lot of free time then because I write very fast, right? So my thesis wasn't the least of my concerns. So I was writing plays, I was writing poetry, I was writing short stories and, you know, in between my study. And I saw an ad for the NUS Shell competition and I go, oh my god, free money. And um, so, so, uh, so, so I tried because I thought I was good at writing, right? And I got a merit prize and I thought, shit, you know, this should be a winner. Why? Okay. So anyway, I was not so full of myself that I thought I knew everything. So I actually bought, okay, 10 year series, right? Past years winners, you know? And I read and I tried to like get down to the secret of why they won, right? Very Singaporean, right? <laughs> and then I just went through all of them and I took notes, very, very hardworking. And then I put all of it into use and I wrote two plays uh, the next year, right? And uh, the results came out and I won first and second and second. And so Ong Heng Sen came up to me, he was one of the judges, and he just came right next to me and like, you want a job or not? <laughs> and he's like, he's going to get funding for the first playwright in residence in Singapore for theatre work. So for a whole year, I was paid to write plays, and that's the most amazing job in the world. Just to write plays and you, know, you don't have to worry about your, your income and stuff like that. But okay, I, I want to... Uh, to, to maybe uh, help the younger ones in our audience. So what is an award-winning play, what does it contain? I realise that there are structures in place that make them believable, realistic and engaging. I realise that there's no fixed formula but there, there, are, there are, some people call them tricks, uh, there are strategies in storytelling that make a story more engaging and more heartfelt than other stories, right? And if you know how to use them, if you're trained in the right resources to use the structures, to use the, you know, um, to find the buttons, right? You can actually make people understand what you want at the heart of what you want to say. Now, sometimes that takes a lot of discipline. Telling stories takes a lot of discipline because you can be so self-indulgent that you want to say everything else. And sometimes you're so excited over the idea, you do want to say everything else, but sometimes you can't because if you pare it down, then you tell the story better. So therein lies the secret in a way, less but more, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so you have to have that discipline. 
Which is so why was this I, what you brought into the writer's lab? Yeah, I, I try to train writers still because writers are so excited and they want to say everything and that's why I still hold writing workshops because I feel that there is a need. There are so many amazing stories still not told. Mm. Many of our stories of the four, our forefathers, our grandfathers and all, they're still not told. And I got lots of people came in, coming to me all the time. Hey, you write for me, like, write for me, you know? And I'm going like, you can write it yourself. I don't know your families. I'm not interested in your family, seriously. Mm -hmm. But why don't you write it yourself, right? So we still have to get our body of works right, you know, mm -hmm. of that generation that had no voice then. We still need to tell their story. So, you know, um, I still continue to train because I think it's important, yeah. Tell us about this, uh, because you were, you were the first ever writer in residence at uh, Paid Taylor's. one, yeah. <laughs> That's important, we need to live. Okay, <laughs> all right. Yeah. So, uh, tell, tell us about that. Um, I was tasked to be up there on the hill with Daetong, King Sen and every, the whole gang there. Um, it was an amazing, amazing uh, time and place to just write X number of plays, which I would propose myself. And we brought in six amazing playwrights from around the world to come and train us. And we opened it up to Singaporeans who wanted to join, and 15 showed up, 15 signed on. Um, there, were, there were names that you would recognize today, Eka Chai, Eleanor Wong, Ovidia Yu, Tan Tan Hao, Russell was one of, you're one of them. Did you attend any of them? You, you attended that too, yes. Uh, Robin attended it too. Um, so many of us, you know. And, um, we had an amazing year. We had an amazing year of people coming in, you know, taking us through different workshops. Um, I held play readings up there. I had poet I held poetry readings up there. Um, I held anything that you could write and read up there, right, basically. We had one or two theatre festivals up there too because there was so much work being done at that time. Mm. We had black box readings for the first time because last time we did not have black box readings and King Sen brought the black box mm. into being. Mm. Uh, we had... And now this is commonplace. Now all the theatres have a youth wing, have a black box, have all this. Mm. It doesn't sound like very much anymore, but mm. at that time that was just an amazing opportunity to work. Mm. You know, and, and for a long time we playwrights just looked at their work. It was sad because in the 1960s a lot of playwrights thought their work was not appreciated, not loved, not wanted, and they threw away their plays. So when King Sen started theatre works and were hunting for those plays, half of them were thrown away. They were not like locked away, they were thrown away because the playwright just said no one was interested, so I threw it away. Mm -hmm. So theatre works started this whole tradition of like, you know. Um, so not archived, right? Uh, I in don't, the 60s. Yeah, in example. the 60s it wasn't archived. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they were literally giving their works away free for anyone who wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So when we started Writer's Lab, we wanted to also train our writers to say your work has worth. Mm -hmm. Your work should be paid for. Why would a carpenter who does a set be paid for and then you are the writer and your work is not paid for? It's nonsense, right? Mm -hmm. um, we wanted people to realise that there is dignity in the work that's being done and that it's worth. Yeah. So, so this one year journey was a fantastic period for, for growth, you know? For growth, yes. for maturity of writers, mm -hmm. um, for us to stop and think, mm -hmm. for us to influence each other. You know, when we listen to each other's work, we grow. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it was a, it's a great time and and um, yeah, so I found that again happening in KL right now, which mm. we're going to later. Mm. Okay. And that's why the last three years I've been absent. I've been going to KL to do my plays there. Right. Because the same thing is happening in English theatre. It's starting to sizzle and bubble. And it's why, very why did this period only last a year in theatre works? No, no, no. It, it went on for a while. Okay. Um, the black box continued. Robin took over the writer's lab. Mm. Um, there were Tan Hao took over that then Robin. Right. Okay. Um, it, it, it's grown and grown and grown okay. with, with a lot of care, a lot of love from all the people who took on with it. Mm. Um, and there were other writers that came up through it, the, through the um, through Theatre Works 24-hour competition, mm. writing competition. Yes. That one has right. been going on for years, okay. you know, discovering new talents for years. Okay. Yeah. And, then, and then you went away again because of the Fulbright. You ah, said because... Uh, after a year of working there, of mm. like holding a lot of readings, a lot of, you know, workshops being reported in the press. Mm -hmm. um, the US Embassy had actually tracked me because they found that, I, th I think we were inviting all the embassies to come and watch it, to, mm -hmm. to see what Singapore is doing, right? Mm -hmm. So I was invited, one day I got a call 
this American voice said, hey, you want to go to America for three months? I like, what? We have free, free trip again? Free trip again. Yes. <laughs> so, so I said, yes, please. Uh, who are you? And then they said they were the American embassy and, you know, uh, they were giving me a full ride to go. And my trip would involve going to NYU and then making my way across the US at all the major theatre festivals that were happening at that time. So I actually got to hang out with all these artists and actors and writers and you know, um, get to bring my work there to also have readings and just see how it stood among other people. And it was again mind-blowing because I saw the standards there, I was amazed by how hard it is to get the play done there to really appreciate my plays being done here. You know, because mm. at that time, if any of us in the first 15 had written a play, the chance of it being produced was pretty damn high because the theatres were hungry for our plays, right? Mm. But in America, it's 600 to 1 in a minor, minor theatre. On Broadway, 3,000 to 1 or like 5,000 to 1 because everyone's sending scripts all the time, you know? Uh, so it was such a privilege to have your play done. So I really learned a lot from that trip, yeah. So, so what, did, what, what did that trip give you? Um, it opened my mind to standards that were out there, to concepts that were out there that made people want to write. So I, I was the one that brought back the 10-minute play competition. Because Eka Chai took my two anthologies which I brought back. I was reading them, enthusing every time I met him. Then he says, show me, show me. So I just show it to him and he says, oh, wow, cool. Then he started that, mm. right? Mm. And then, of course, I've had so much readings in 10-minute plays, I won the first one. So, you know, there again, another free trip to US. Um, <laughs> so, wait, 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 wait. This, this, this uh, conversation is uh, fast becoming a how to get free trips. <laughs> well, <laughs> the you'll secrets never, of Desmond Sim. No, you'll, <laughs> never, you'll never, never get rich in theatre. But you get to see amazing things and you could meet amazing people. Mm. That's what you get. Mm. You'll never get rich in theatre. Mm. I feel a bit guilty when I hold all these causes because young people look up to me and go like, oh my god, you know, you have such a wonderful life. No, I, I got this comfortable life from being a businessman for more than a decade. Mm. Okay, it's not from theatre, mm. right? But, but mm. I got my most amazing experiences through theatre. That's, that's the truth, mm. yeah? Um, Tell us about that because, uh, you know, Desmond Sim, businessman. Yeah. How did that start? Um, I was buying a tie at, <laughs> at Isetan <laughs> Marine Parade. And then I met an old school friend who said, hey, that's why, where have you been all these years? I said, studying literature. And, uh, oh, um, I'm working for Hun Chai, who's my classmate. Mm. Upstairs, big office, you know. Mm. So I went up and like, oh, hi, hi. And I've been freelancing, supporting my theatre by learning graphic design. And this guy looks at me, he's the boss of a company, he says, hey, you write well, you do this, you've got a master's degree, you know what, I, I am looking for people, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I can make you a partner, you don't have to put money in, but you just bring your talents. So I was very lucky. And I, at that point, I, my father had just passed away, I had three decisions. One, go back to my first job, and my first job was making airline food, 15,000 meals a day at SATS Catering, S-A-T-S, not S-E-X. <laughs> SATS Catering, right? Singapore Airport Terminal Services, 15,000 meals a day. I was manager, cracked the whip, 400 people at a go. Uh, or, so they said I could go back after my master's if I, you know, if I wanted to, or I could become an NUS um, doctor, PhD doctorate. They were going to send me to study in the UK. Um, or I could be a businessman. So I thought, I'll try a businessman if I feel and come back and beg for the scholarship, right? Because if I did it the other way around and got the scholarship, I'd be bonded to them for life, right? So I did the businessman path, yeah? And then, thank God, it, it, it worked out, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So, uh, because you were telling me that to be a businessman, you had a secret resolution. Yeah. I actually dearly wanted the life of an academic because that would allow me time to write. I'm essentially a writer. But being a businessman, I had to make myself a promise to write at least one play a year, which I did. It didn't matter if it was a 10-minute play or 40-minute play or a full-length play. I had to write one play a year. So if I reached the end of the year and I didn't have a play written, I would take leave to write a play. I would take leave, go to Malacca and write a play. Um, I promised myself that and I did that because now I have 30 over plays, which is why I have 30 over plays. Yeah. Um, 
So not only plays, right, but uh, poetry as well. Yeah, I think I won something. <laughs> in some, you know, that one. <laughs> um, I don't know, I think I got a lot of spare energy. So, you know, in between writing plays, I write poetry. Then after a while, I found that, oh, I got a lot of poetry. Then, then another competition came out. Oh, there's money there, I sent it in. Um, I have to survive, right? Artists got to survive, right? So, so I sent in and then, oh, they didn't give a first prize. This was, the, this was like a second prize, but the top prize for the year, right? Uh, they liked it, but not enough, apparently. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, yeah, I've got an anthology of poems. Okay. Um, my journeys, right, at that time. Because, because you were saying that already as a young child, you were, you were sort of like writing rhymes and... Yeah, you know, that was to impress my aunties, la, but this is different. Mm -hmm. um, this one was because at that time, places where I've been, I believe that if you go to a certain place, and the place moves you emotionally, I didn't want to take a photograph, I wanted to write. Mm -hmm. I sit down and write a man. I write my emotional photograph of the place um, or the emotional photograph of the people I met, like my grandmother, right? I see her making acha, I talk to her and then I get a feeling and I write it. Mm -hmm. I mean, a photograph will capture that. Mm -hmm. So these were all photographs of places where I've been, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, mm -hmm. I felt that they were more meaningful and apparently people got it, people understood it, so that was nice, mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, but, you know, between poetry and playwriting, you know, you write it as if it's, you talk about it as if it's a clear line, but mm -hmm. there's poetry in my lines, in my plays. Mm -hmm. If you read Autumn Tomeo, you realize that a large part of it is poetic prose. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's very hard to draw a line. Mm -hmm. They're just mm -hmm. different modes of expression uh, in, in different formats, la, I mm -hmm. guess. Okay. It's like marketing, I teach marketing, but that's also in some ways uh, communication. You know, it's a, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a creative way of communicating as well. And, and uh, earlier you were telling us about how you brought back uh, your anthologies of 10-minute uh, plays, and then... Um, I brought back the prize-winning anthologies from Actors Theatre of Louisville. They had run the competition for more than a decade at the time when I went. Um, at that time when I went, two to 3,000 entries a year were flying into Actors Theatre because the 10-minute play is a wonderful way to start people writing plays. But it's also very good exercise for experienced playwrights. They are like haikus. If you're very, very good, they can be powerful and blow you away in 10 minutes, you know? Um, so it's good for experienced or not experienced writers. So it's very welcoming, very, very inclusive, yeah. So this is how it started in Singapore, for example. Well, Eka Chai started yes. it, but I, yeah, I, I, I showed him the, the concept, okay. he loved right. it, yeah. So, so, so tell us uh, about the, the first one, right? He started... Drunken Prawns. Yes. Yeah. And then he... Okay, uh, remember, I remember the year clearly because Ko Pao Kun was judging that Drunken Prawns. Um, yeah, it's in this anthology. Pao Kun... Oh yes, this is very important. Pao Kun... I was not known then, right? Mm -hmm. So Pao Kun actually read it. Mm -hmm. And if you read this play, you understand that this is a very Pao Kun kind of play. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's, it's very local, very simple, but the issues are all there. And... Tell us about it, actually. He, he, okay. I had gone to a seafood restaurant and a quarrel erupted at the next table. And what was it about? A daughter and a father were fighting over a bowl of drunken prawns. Because the father is not rich, he's a clerk, like clerical guy, mm. and he was treating his family to expensive food. And I could tell it was not often that they eat this. Mm. But the daughter was lecturing him on how... how what, what did she say? She said, oh, how cruel you are to the prawns. You couldn't kill them normally, you got to burn them in alcohol and all that. And then, you know, if you can kill prawns this way, I don't want to talk about it. Because the father said, what you think, prawns got souls. Huh? And then she says, you know, I don't want to talk about your soul if you're so cruel to be, uh, and God's animals. And he, to a point where he almost slapped her. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my God, drama, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, when the competition came out, I just wrote it and shaped it to a, a, a drama format, mm. added my own little characters and other things, and then it won. And Pao Kun leaned over to Ekachai, Ekachai told me this. Mm. Pao Kun said, this guy is either very good or a very good fluke. <laughs> <laughs> because he said everything just worked, you know, it was like... So I've lived my whole life trying to prove to Pao Kun that I'm not a fluke. Mm. So every piece was there, here you go, I'm not a fluke, you know. Mm. Even if although he's up there, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, well, you 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 have a Pao Kun story to share with us later on, all right? So, uh, so so from from drunken prawns, uh, uh, what happened after that? 
because uh, you you then had another ten minute play, uh, uh, which oh, was yeah. picked up by because I won for Drunken Prawns. My <laughs> so funny, full circle. My my prize was to go back to.